Hi, my name is Gordy Hogue, and this is Community Connection. Each of us have stories, stories that help us understand each other and help to bring our community closer together. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people. People who've had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond. People who've had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories. Community Connections is about these people and about their stories. I'm sure you'll enjoy meeting these amazing people as much as I have. Thank you. Please enjoy. I am pleased today to have Joan McMurtry as our guest on Community Connections. She is a leader in the provision of spiritual, social, and emotional support to the people of our community and beyond. Welcome, Joan. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's a, indeed an honor to have you here and uh, to talk a little bit about your background, how you came to this community, and the many contributions you've made to many other communities. So you were born in Saskatchewan. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and your progress to this community? <laughs> I was born, yeah, born and raised in Saskatchewan, which I'm pretty proud of, you know, prairie, prairie roots. Uh, they go deep, you know, deep with kind of values of family and community. And um, for me, raised in the church, it was the seed of the social gospel movement. And so that sense of being in it together. And um, I was born in Radville, Saskatchewan. My dad was a minister. My mom was a nurse. And uh, we were there for a number of years. We lived for a while in Alberta, just south of Edmonton, and then moved to Moose Jaw. Um, and then I did high school, finished high school in Saskatoon. So I think of Saskatoon as my, as my city. I finished high school. I went to University of Saskatchewan there, did a degree, a degree in sociology and psychology. And then I went into theology school at St. Andrews College, which is on the same campus. Yeah, my, my dad is from a small town in Saskatchewan, too, and yeah, yeah. Has brought a lot of that along to, to yeah. our community and to our family as well. Yeah, we, we like to think of ourselves as kind of on a mission when we come out to BC, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's lots, lots to work with in BC. <laughs> yeah, but I've been out here for 30 years, so, um, yeah. And then you, uh, in the ministry, you were one of the first female ministers in the United Church? Yeah, um, you know, our history goes way back to 1936 when, you know, the national courts agreed that women actually could serve, which is sort of ironical because women actually were serving all across the country, but decided that it was uh, actually uh, within uh, the faith tradition that, that we could ordain women. But really the encouragement or incentive to go into ministry wasn't there until the 70s which was around the women's movement and that's when i came into ministry i was always going to be a teacher a social worker and um anyway when i was in college my first year i was the only only female in the in the student body so i was you know proud of that early pioneering set of women in the 70s who began to kind of break ground in saskatchewan my first appointment was in rural Saskatchewan, um, Kelvington and Lintlaw. And it was a wonderful experience. The people were very welcoming of me. And um, I remember when the presbyter was saying, you know, well, would you accept a woman if we put a woman here with you? This was in 1976. They said, oh, wow, you know, wouldn't be the first one. You know, we had <laughs> Lydia Grucci, who actually was the first ordained woman in the you know, in Church of Canada, she was here in the 30s. <laughs> <laughs> so they turned uh, him on his head and uh, welcomed me. I had a wonderful time. And then I, I did that for three years. And then I found that people were coming to me with their family issues and problems. And I thought I needed more skills. So I spent a year at the Calgary Pastoral Institute um, and um, did family and therapy yeah, counseling. And uh, that was great. I thought I might stay there, but I, I realized that I, I liked working in community and with groups. And uh, I would meet with someone one-on-one, -on -one and I think, gosh, you know, what they really need is a, a community of support. And I thought, well, what is a community of support? Well, it's, it's a congregation. So then I was called into, uh, into Regina, which was, was very exciting. Yeah. Is that when you started doing some work as well with uh, First Nations? 
Absolutely. Um, this was in the 80s. This was a working class parish. It was the neighborhood that many of the families were moving in from the reserves. Um, there was a lot of uh, tension in the community. When I moved in in 1980, there was a you know, a task force examining, you know, police and police dogs that seemed to be, um, well, we're out of control um, in terms of relate, in terms of bites and uh, of First Nations people. So, uh, so it was a very engaging time. And uh, I, I remember, uh, you know, early on in my ministry, we, we were sitting around as a board and one of the women said, you know, these children, you know, says, what are they doing after school? You know, they just came along and they, like they just pulled out my tulips. I said, well, why would they do that? And what's going on? So we, we had this kind of full and rich conversation about who, who is it that's moving into our neighborhood? Um, and the conversation moved beyond that to saying, well, well, maybe these kids need a place to go after school. Maybe they, you know, whatever's happening with their families, obviously there's a lot of kind of stress going on, poverty. So it initiated a, a program that went on for many years, which was an after-school program for children of the community. And we hired someone to be the leader. We worked with the, uh, the local YWCA on programming and uh, the children started coming into our building and they thought it was theirs. And uh, when I would try and explain to them that it wasn't my house, they just didn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and they were welcome, and gradually the parents began to see that building as a place of safety and welcome. And, and from there, uh, we then began to partner with the um, Regina Native Ministry, which is what it was called at the time. And so that minister moved into our building, and we began to be really connected. And I think the thing I remember most clearly from that is one of the elders of the congregation who lives in the neighborhood said to me, you know, Joan, he said, the only place I interact with native people is in our building. Yeah. They're my neighbors, but somehow we don't connect, but we do when we're in the building together. So it, it was a very challenging and kind of wonderful learning experience for me of being in intercultural relationships, learning about First Nations people, you know, it was, was a great time. And it's something that uh, we as a country are still working on. Absolutely. These are early roots of all of the issues that we're talking about now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly welcoming and being welcomed by them is an important part of the iterative process that uh, yeah. a lot of us uh, to realize how, what, what common values we have in so many ways. Yeah, absolutely. And the courage of a, like a little group of people. Eh? This is a working class parish who, who just thought, well, yeah, maybe, maybe we could just open our doors and, 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 and maybe the kids could have a safe place. Yeah. You know, that took courage in the 1980s in Regina, North Central Regina. Yeah. And from there you moved on to UBC, was it? Yeah, I um, I guess I was a bit burned out. Might be a, a phrase. I, I felt exhausted, and um, so I thought, well, maybe I need time to reflect on it. So I came out to UBC. I was in the Department of Adult Education. I did a master's degree, and I focused on education as a vehicle of social change. So. I was interested in how, how do you work with a community, whether it's a parish or a neighborhood, um, to, to evoke change, to develop a kind of a different consciousness. Uh, so I studied social movement theory, conscientization, and uh, it was a really rich time for me, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's amazing how much uh, insight communities have at a large point, if you give them that opportunity to, to stand up yeah. and you can yeah. talk about the things that are important to them. Yeah, I think that's an important lesson for all people who are in positions of, of leadership. That uh, yeah, many, many ways a, a community's good idea is way better than your great idea. <laughs> yeah, right. And then I was called into a congregation in Carisdale. They were looking for someone who had some educational skills to nurture the leadership. You know, I'm essentially an educator, 
And so there at Knox United, I um, initiated um, a course in preaching for lay people, a course in pastoral care for lay people. And I just thought, well, my responsibility is to pass on some of my gifts best gifts. So uh, I did a lot of education there and I did a lot of support of students from um, the Theological College at UBC. And then uh, I spent five years working for the provincial church in doing uh, support work with clergy, interpreting policy, um, and then finally realized I, I needed to come back to the parish. And so that's how I ended up in White Rock. And it was a congregation who said they were looking for someone who would help them more firmly connect with the community, who would do some of the education work that I knew I was interested in, and were interested in some innovative or creative worship preaching. So it seemed like a match, and I feel very lucky to have been to be called here. So a number of the programs that you initiated within the context of the church were probably also cutting edge programs within the context of the community more broadly. So you were initiating a number of programs which uh, have in many cases become part of society now more more generally but you were on the cutting edge of a number of those yeah. well and first united was as well um right. you know the first gathering um that ended up to be women's place was in the basement of our church i remember that yes um semiamu house you know some of the elders of the church were some of the founding members of that organization when they saw that there was that incredible need. So I came into a congregation that had really deep roots in, in the community. And then we expanded on that. Sounded like a perfect match. Yeah, it was a good match, and yeah. 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 So uh, I understand that it's sort of the, as churches are, are having fewer and fewer members of the congregation yet, the needs are growing greatly, and you've been on the cutting edge of looking at uh, at how churches can evolve, how churches can have a new presence within the context of communities, given the, the social changes we're facing. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your vision for that and the actions that you've been taking within that? Hmm. Well, I, you know, I think... Uh, I think the church needs to be connected with the community, partnering with the community, um, sensitive to what's happening uh, w within the community and being able to respond. We need to kind of loosen up on our theology so that it's not so rigid and judgmental. Um, the church I'm with, the United Church of Canada, is the most liberal progressive. Um, we were the first to ordain women. We were the first to ordain gays and lesbians. Um, we, we need to be on that kind of open, inclusive, cutting edge of, of society and to assist people to develop their spirituality and their practice um, that's, that has the integrity of that kind of inclusivity. So those are some of the more theological sort of areas. Yeah. And, uh, and to develop um, a vision of being a presence in the community um, that is uh, willing to take a stand on supporting people most vulnerable uh, and particularly the marginalized. You know, whether that um, be First Nations people or whether that be kind of women in trouble or whether that be, um, be people in poverty or homelessness. So an, yeah, so an example of that would be um, when I was sitting around a table with other community leaders in an organization called Penin uh, Peninsula Homeless to Housing, um, uh, Peter from Options, an agency that's responsible for looking at poverty and housing, said, you know, we need an extreme weather shelter in the, in the area. Well, I was sitting at the table and, and also another, uh, another fellow from the congregation, and we just looked at each other and it just made sense to us. Well, we would just do that. And then we said, well, we have to check with the board and everyone, of course. And that kind of ability to respond comes out of a way of thinking about being the church that's quite important in these days. And, um, and that, of course, has um, assisted First United and now Peninsula United Church um, 
to be more connected with the community and to be seen as a place of safety and welcome for people who who generally are marginalized. And the congregation yeah. took that on and you I remember raising you're raising funds to put a shower in at one point. Yeah, absolutely. And that partnered with like the um the um community uh, contributed to that, other congregations, uh the firefighters donated a significant amount for that. So it became community and the volunteers over the years always were a mixture of community and church people. So it was a really good modeling of reaching out, meeting a crucial need. And not just providing that um, the practicality of a safe place to sleep and some food and some clothing, but also raising awareness about issues. So a perfect example of how a community can come together yeah. in ways that to coordinate and integrate and provide a service. Yeah. The church being a facility that was ideal for that in the center of our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The leadership in terms of that. Mm -hmm. And you've also been involved in a number of other social programs that have, have helped people who are in need. Uh, you've uh, involved in, been involved in, more recently, I think, in Feed My City. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the community here is very, um, is very, very responsive. There's about four or five different organizations, mainly churches, who have provided what we call community dinners. So almost every day of the week, uh, there's a dinner that is free to anyone who wants to come. There's always a little box there if you can contribute, but it is responding to people on low income, um, seniors, people with disabilities, or people who just need a friendly face uh, on a weekly day. Um, and those all shut down with the uh, COVID-19 virus. And I thought, oh man, these folks are isolated in their homes. They count on those food programs to supplement their income and they um, like what's happening with them. So I did a bit of reaching out to see what was happening with the community groups. Many of them at that time were, um, well, we were being told to stay at home, particularly people who are seniors. Many of those volunteers in the community dinners are seniors, so they're considered some of the some of the vulnerable population, and so began to just talk with a whole variety of people of as to what we might do. Um, worked very closely with Fraser Health to see what would be acceptable and what would be safe about serving a takeaway. And uh, anyway, what's emerged is a five day a week free hot lunch program which is terrific. Again, that's, you know, the Rotary Club has stepped in and cut that imagination. The city was very helpful in providing, you know, parking lot and uh, giving us room there and a bit of publicity. So that's, um, that's really terrific. Yeah. And meeting a need, right? Yes. Yeah. What areas do you think we still need to, uh, obviously there are lots of needs in a community and the coordination and information and integration is a way of identifying and working with that. What do you think are the, what do you see as the future of our community in terms of addressing needs and the areas we should be looking at more effectively? Well, I'll, I'll always say housing. Yeah. Um, you know, 50, 60 years ago, um, the federal government began to, to withdraw from building housing. You know, a lot of the three, four walk-ups, which is in our community, were built in that era with the support of federal and provincial housing. Uh, there hasn't been that kind of funding for decades. Uh, if you look at the st statistics, as soon as the government started reducing the building of housing, began the rise of poverty and homelessness. It's a direct correlation. Uh, we, need, we need housing in the peninsula that is suitable for people with disabilities that is uh, appropriate for, people who've been on the streets where they can get extra support, uh, and just some, some basic lower income housing for the up to 18, 20% of people in the peninsula who are at poverty level. Uh, so that, I mean, give a person a house, that then they can begin to deal with whatever is, other issues that they're facing. So I'd always, I'd always talk about housing, you know, housing shovel in the ground yeah. 
Yeah. I think uh, Samyama House's Unity Building is a perfect Absolutely. Example. It's a wonder, wonderful model. Yeah, wonderful yeah. model. And along with that is a, um, it's kind of an attitude in our community that values diversity, uh, diversity of all kinds. You know, when I first came to White Rock, people said to me, oh, Joe, what are you going to White Rock? It's all middle and, and middle class and upper class people. And I knew that that wasn't true. But there's a, that expression is still going around as if it's a longing for that. Well, you know, we're not. We're, we're a diverse group of people, economically, you know, socially, in terms of our faith traditions or not, in terms of our ethnicity. And um, so to begin to develop a, a sense of uh, diversity as being valued and actually interesting and vital, um, that goes along with doing some concrete action around, uh, around building some homes for people. And that's one of the things I really like about the Unity Building yeah. in House is that those people with the intellectual disabilities, that they all initially wanted to be on the same floor together and they, they said, no, you're going to be mixed amongst them. And it's turned out so extremely well to be there and watch, watch them walk into the building and integrate and, and talk with everyone. It's really a, a great example of what, what our community more broadly could be. Absolutely. And that's kind of a philosophy or a culture that you develop. Yeah. And so, you know, along with practical programming, it's, it's talking with people about well, what kind of, kind of world we want to live in, what kind of community do we want to live in? And how can we live it, live in it together where everyone's at least their basic needs are being met. Yeah. So what are the things you do uh, to, to support your own self, your physically and emotionally and spiritually? Uh, you like <laughs> golfing and walking? Can you talk about Yeah, little? Yeah, I, I play golf uh, kind of badly, but I enjoy <laughs> it. I play bridge um, and I'm a walker. And uh, a lot of my kind of renewal energy comes from walking. I've, been four or five different times to the Himalayas and done long and extended walks. My longest was 30 days. And somehow walking in the mountains, you know, they call the Himalayas the land of the gods. Yeah. And there's something about doing that walk in the mountains, even on my own, that I feel more rooted in the earth, in myself, in the spirit of life, and with, with others than anywhere else. So the picture behind me is from Wales. And I spent two weeks walking in Wales, right? up and down the hills and along the coastline. And uh, so that's kind of one of my, my spiritual practices is being on journey and walking um, and day after day in a kind of an extended time. Do you and you know, all my, all my travels are canceled now because of COVID-19. <laughs> so I'm walking the pier and walking our neighborhood and you know, that's got its own richness too. So is it almost like a meditation when you're walking on your own? And it, it is. It is. In fact, I've done some teaching around walking as spiritual practice and walking with groups and teaching about how, how it is you be present to yourself and present to nature and present to each other. And, and when all of that happens, you end up being present to God. Um, so it's, yeah. Can you give us a, a short lesson in that, those of us who are <laughs> watching this and participating in that? Could we have a, a short lesson in, in that? Well, one of the lessons is periodically like to be quiet, like not to chatter. You know, I see people walking, often they're chatting together, and that's, I mean, that's okay. That's part of why you're together is you want to connect. But also being silent it can be a really good discipline. So in terms of a walk, I often, if there's a group of us, I'm often either at the back or the front because I'm away from the chatter. Yeah. And, uh, and then I go back and I chatter with people and, and then I stop. So that would be w w one of the lessons. And then sometimes I have a mantra, which is a, a phrase um, or a word that I'm looking for. And it might be gratitude or it, it might be... Um, uh, notice, uh, notice the beauty. So that lives with me for a, a four hour stretch. And somehow with, with saying that, I see beauty in a new way. Or um, go with God. 
uh, when I say that and I'm walking and like somehow that has an impact on me. So those are a couple of things when walking. When, when did you start walking? Is that something that is relatively new or something? Oh, probably, I don't know, it's about 20 years ago now. It's the first time that I, I did a major walk in the Himalayas. I guess I've always hiked with friends and been outdoors. But that's where I, I first had that deep sense of the connection and walk, walking as pilgrimage. Yeah. You know, I've, I've done the Camino, which is the walk in Spain. I've, I've done a lot of the walks around the world. So I, I feel really blessed that I've been able to do that. Yeah. But, you know, I can walk around our neighborhood now. And, you know, if I put something in my mind and I'm silent with myself, it can have the same meaning. Well, you've been a wonderful inspiration for, for our community. Is there any, uh, any wishes or hopes or dreams or prayers you have uh, for our community and more broadly for our world today? Well, the simplicity of Dr. Henry, be well, be, be, kind, right? be kind, be connected with each other, yeah. be, be gracious. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joan. Thank you so very much for your time. Uh, and for being so insightful. Uh, you've been a, a true pioneer in a world that uh, for so long was dominated by, by men, and it's a delight to see you, the leadership you've shown as a woman and yeah. as a Thank person you. within our community. Thank you so very Thank much. You. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. Please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts or comments that you may have. We're always trying to do a better job of connecting this audience. Thanks again for joining, and until next time, keep connecting.